Hello and welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. My name is Graham Arrowsmith. And my name's Kevin Appleby. So Graham, we're going to have fun today because we're talking to a man who puts dad jokes all over his website. Yeah, um, uh, it, it's quite an amazing chap. Um, we're talking to him from the beautiful state of New Hampshire at the moment, but he's not actually from there, but he's going to tell us more about that in a second. But um, um, Mike Malloy, welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. Thanks, guys. Uh, I appreciate you having me here. I'm uh, excited to be here. Well, first, we, we have to say, for those people watching us on YouTube, um, out of five, um, everybody who's watching, make, make sure in the comments you, you actually rate Mike's shirt because Mike thinks it's really good. Uh, and Kevin said earlier, it's crap. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I don't know how he does this with guests. And we're lost for words at that point, Graham. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't. I can't even drop you in it, even when I try. Right. So, um, Mike, uh, you your business is all about fractional sales resource. Yep. So I'm the CEO at Malloy Industries. We have uh, a roster of fractional sales executives, and maybe just give you a little bit of background. You know, I've got previous experience as a Deloitte consultant. I was a traveling sunglasses salesman and startup CEO. I ran an incubator program for five years and uh, served as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. And uh, you know, that led me to being pretty passionate uh, about being relentlessly generous and also enthusiastically fun because we're going to slip some of those dad jokes in here for sure. Um, uh, by the way, Graham, do you know what a chiropractor's favorite type of music is? Um, no, I don't. Go on. It's hip pop. So there you go. It's something pop. I, I missed the first word. Hip pop. Hip. Uh. <laughs> yeah, do you know what? I mean, I'm going to have to record these and, and sort of put them as, a, as, as a, a compendium. And then we sort of put that on the show notes. But just in case anybody's um, needing um, um, some kind of humor in their life, like Kevin, for instance, look at him. He's, of he's, course, yes. He I can't wait to get back to his next spreadsheet. But oh. um, uh, but no, no, seriously, Mike, you are um, what a, a range of talents that you've just displayed. Yeah, I have a, a pretty eclectic background. Most people don't get their master's in computer science and then quit their government consulting job to go to the beach to sell sunglasses and play ultimate frisbee. But that was uh, 25-year-old Mike's uh, vision for the world and uh, a little bit wiser if you gray beard uh, here uh, at 37. You know, I have found yeah. that the future of work is fractional. You know, coming out of COVID and the great resignation and quiet quitting and all of these things, you know, if you're a smart person with talent and skills, you don't have to sit in the same seat for 40 hours a week, make your TPS reports and, and go on with your life. Um, you can actually apply that expertise to two, three, four, five different companies uh, serving as a fractional sales executive, helping to you know, raise their revenue, build out their sales teams, identify where there might be holes in the, the funnel uh, or friction in the sales process to uh, oftentimes save time for the founder and the CEO. You know, they're they're wearing 17 different hats and if they can get rid of any of them to somebody, let alone the sales hat, which uh, most entrepreneurs don't consider themselves card-carrying salesmen, uh, would love some support there. I, 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 I'm I massively impressed by you already. Um, the fact that you've done all these different things with your life and you're, and you're, you're, barely, you're the age of my oldest son. So basically you're, you're, you're quite a young man with a lot more to do. What is it that Malloy Industries does that perhaps other people don't do? Yeah, great great question. Uh, part of what we do, um, and we call it the Malloy match, uh, is that we'll do a sales scalability assessment to kind of meet with the entrepreneur, understand what is creating uh, maybe a ceiling on their sales, whether it's a lack of clarity around the business model, uh, or the go-to-market strategy, the pricing model maybe has not been, isn't working that great. They're not you know, making as much money as they could based on the value they're delivering. Um, another thing that we do uh, is kind of a, a CRM audit because a lot of companies have, have crap uh, in their CRM, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If they're not yeah. doing a good job there, nobody trusts it. They're not able to know which of their, their salespeople are actively performing. And what we've done on the, the front end to really help these entrepreneurs is that we have vetted over 249 fractional executives. Um, you know, we focus in the sales arena, but we have folks across the different 
um, business functions, whether that's executive coaching, operations, HR, you know, everybody knows a fractional CFO. It's kind of how the model started uh, back in the day. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we will identify kind of where the gaps are, what expertise that they need, what hats they want to take off. Uh, and then we actually give them three recommended um, fractional executives that the CEO will interview uh, and based on that, pick their favorite one to hire and knock on wood, uh, we're undefeated uh, on at least one of the three uh, being somebody that they want to work with. And in the rare case that, you know, somebody says, Hey, I don't like any of these three, we'll give them three new ones for free. Uh, you know, we charge a little flat fee on the front end to do that matchmaking. Um, and one of the best parts about working with a fractional executive is that it's not a six figure salary and a long-term commitment. It's a, typically a three month engagement for maybe five to 10,000 to get started. You see how it goes, and then you ramp up or down month to month as you need it. So yeah. it gives a lot of flexibility. I noticed on your website, you were talking about the, the rate for a fractional person, the being a retainer, and you were talking about hourly rates. Okay. That sounds very much like the model that I'm used to. I know a lot of fractional CFOs that work that way. But um, a model that sales folk have used in the past extensively would be a commission model. You, know, you get yeah. paid by results. Does that yep. fit into your world? We are very flexible in how we do the pricing and what models work both for the fractional executives and for the companies. We don't do anything on a purely commission base, uh, you know, because there is time and energy that's going in on the front end. And, you know, we serve primarily B2B companies that are selling some sort of technology product. Uh, but the sales cycle might range from a month to two years. You know, if you're selling in a higher education uh, the commission takes a long time for some of those larger ones. Uh, so we do look for, you know, a, a flat rate um, and then can be creative with commissions as the upside. So making sure everybody's aligned there. Um, and in some cases, though, it's just hey, it's 5K a month and you're going to get this much of my time. But salespeople also are not the best always at tracking their time. They're not lawyers. They're not going to bill you on six minute increments, you know. Uh, they're going to say, hey, you know, eight hours, I'm going to give you a day. I'll probably give you a day and a half and, you know, make sure we're getting you the results. At the end of the day, it's the results that matters, you know, are, yeah. are they qualified leads at the top of the funnel? Are they working their way through the funnel? You know, how many of them are, are closing and, and what's the velocity through the sales funnel? I'm all about velocity, both in terms of our sales and, and what the sales executives we work with are providing for clients. One of the things that pops up on your website, Mike, is this thing called um, a sales scalability scorecard. Um what I picked up from what you've just said is that you, you're, you are niched in terms of B2B sales, at least, you know, you're not all things to everybody. So you can't just come along and get a sales guy and, you know, sell these, I don't know, plant pots. Um, it's, it's not, that's not your thing. Um, so you, you're getting people who have got a reasonable chance of matching to your industry. That's the first thing. And the second thing is back to this question, which is you've got this sc sales scalability. Does it, what does it, what does that actually mean? Yeah, so we we found um, that there are kind of six different pillars in the sales system within your business. There's the business model clarity. There's the sales technology tools. So what's the tech stack look like that you're using to automate some of these things? Yeah. There's your actual sales team and training. So in a lot of companies that we'll work with, they might have one or two SDRs or BDRs, you know, kind of business development reps booking appointments. They have a few account executives. Uh, how are they actually doing? And, and are they trained? Are they getting the support they need? Uh, the founder and CEO may be a good salesperson, but they may be a pretty bad sales manager and not actually running effective uh, you know, sales meetings on a weekly basis, giving the, the training that people need. And the way the founder sells is very different than the way every other human being who comes into the company is going to sell. Uh, and we need to be thoughtful about what are the kind of uh, processes and methodologies that don't require the founder's origin story and their zest and personality, you know? Um, and then we also look at in that scorecard, the performance metrics and analysis. Uh, and so what are we measuring through the funnel, uh, marketing qualified leads, sales qualified leads, appointments booked, how many people are showing up? Um, how many meetings does it take uh, to get to the proposal stage? What's the win, way, win rate? Um, I also love measuring the from the moment we made first contact with them to the day that the first amount of money showed up in the bank account, like that is the ultimate metric for me on terms of velocity what's, through the funnel. What's that? What have you give that a name? Because that's a really good measure. Yeah, um, I, I call it days to first money. Like how no. many days does it take to get the first money? And 
that oh. uh, you know, even if it start you start work, but then it's net thirty or they don't pay. It takes a little while versus Kevin salivating. He's salivating now because you've mentioned money and 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 you know it, I, can, that, that's a great measure. Actually, it's correct. a fantastic measure. Mm. And so many business owners don't actually know what that is. Like it, it takes a little bit of work to look and like go back in the emails. Like for those listening, you know, something you can do in the next hundred days, in the next you know yeah. maybe an hour look at your five newest clients when did they first pay you and then when was the first time somebody contacted them mm. uh and you get a sense of oh like i thought my sales cycle was like a month and a half but it's actually 82 days like wow that, that's almost three months like yeah it can impact the rate at which you can invest back into business because you need to you know what's the customer acquisition cost that you have to kind of make the money back that it costs to sell them and acquire them and then that you gotta you know balance out your cogs like whatever the cost of goods sold is and then you start to make the profit. So like, when is the profit actually kicking in based on all of these things? And then when do they stop paying you because they churn or you're not doing a good job and you got to factor that in as well uh, yeah. so that it's a positive uh, black number, not a red number, ideally. Oh, that's a really interesting metric. And I guess put on top of that, some sort of metric that talks about all of the various touch points during that process yeah. would be powerful. Yeah. And oh, I-, I guess probably one of the, the easy thing to do is spot the money going at the bank. The hard thing to do is spot the the activity that actually sparked that that whole flow off in the first place. Mm. You know, how did customer find out about you, or how did you find out about customer? Yep, yeah, and and I'll throw out a great question that I, I put on a lot of my like Calendly forms and people are booking meetings. Instead of being like, you know, how'd you hear about us? We ask, how can we thank for sending you our way? Mm-hmm. And it's a little cheeky, friendly way of being like, hey, who was the referral and Part of it is also we, you know, we like to pay people who refer paying clients our way and give them a, a uh, you know, and uh, what's this guy? Well, Google has actually been, been a good source for us as well. So people have been, uh, you know, finding us online. But uh, I think it's helpful to track the different sources and the channels because uh, as a business, you have these high level marketing activities you're doing to try to generate these leads. Uh, and and what's the the differentiate? A marketing qualified lead is, is like they downloaded a thing, they expressed some level of interest, but they haven't responded to you directly talking to them. You know, where a sales qualified lead is like you send them an email and they respond and they say, okay, I'll book a meeting or like even just respond and start a conversation. Like, okay, you know, we're qualifying them there. Um, and I think that's helpful for you to think about where are they coming so that you know, eighty twenty rule, you know, twenty percent of the sources are creating 80% of the, the qualified leads. The people that you've got as fractional salespeople, I, I, what kind of, they're, they're, they've got a journey that's taken them to your place. Um, what What's typical of their journey? Yeah, so uh, their journey, they're often older than me and Graham, maybe a little younger than you, uh, you know, in that, well, that, that puts a heck of a, a stretch on it then. I, I know. Uh, and, um, you know, I would say 15 to 35 years of experience, you know, they they have been selling for many years um, yeah. or if they're, they work in a different function, like they have decades of experience that sure. you're not hiring a fractional executive to train them how to do the thing they're doing. They're coming in as the grown up, as the professional who knows how to do this so well that they don't have to be with you for 40 hours a week because you couldn't afford the you know $250,000 salary they might cost. Yeah. Uh, but 250 bucks an hour for 10 hours a week is much more digestible. Yeah. Uh, and it allows you to get that expertise that can then be disseminated into the organization. You know, they're there to help teach other people. There might be a mid-level manager or a junior person that you already have that can report up to them, which also creates some space for the current C-suite to not have as many direct reports and they kind of follow to the fractional executive. That executive will meet, you know, once a week for 30 to 60 minutes with the CEO, shuffle up the information they need. Um, because these folks have been in, you know, venture backed companies, they've been in publicly traded companies. Um, many of them have entrepreneurial paths, uh, paths as well, either as, you know, co-founders or early employees. Um, and so, you know, one of our core values is to be independently productive. We're going to get shit done. Uh, and we'll communicate effectively, but you don't have to be standing over our shoulder being like, Hey, you know, push that button right there. No, they do this thing. Uh, you know, they, they know how to do it. And, and we're bringing some playbooks and methodologies that have been proven to be successful, uh, at other companies. So let me just unpick it a little bit more because 
I'm I'm seeing these really qualified people go into these organisations, commissioning organisations who want their help. But are, are they going to go in and right, Joe? Here's you know five sales leads. Go and close those because well, you're better than our guys. Or is it they're going to go in and they're going to sort of help others to sort of raise all boats, sort of thing? Is it are they going to train others? Or both? How how does it actually work when they're actually in situ? Yeah, great question. And um, it depends is the short answer because it depends what they have in place and where are they struggling the most. Um, and also how long is the engagement? You know, in some cases, it's only three to six months and we're going to do the best we can, but we're going to train the people coming behind us. You know, we have clients we've been working with for over two years and I don't think we're going to stop anytime soon because we're an ingrained part of the team that is supporting the growth overall of the organization, uh, facilitating a lot of kind of cross-functional collaboration with marketing and fulfillment and finance, like making sure everybody knows, um, you know, where we're going. I think uh, they'll definitely do some individual contributing and like be in sales meetings, do the selling, help with the language and, you know, little um, um, tricks or tips or methods, you know, for being more effective. Uh, like, for example, do you guys know what a BAM fam is? Nope. So uh, BAMFAM stands for book a meeting from a meeting. The goal of every sales meeting is to get the next meeting. And so if you got a 30 minute meeting at the very beginning, you want to do a time check and a tech check, you know, Hey, Kevin, you know, we got 30 minutes for this call to make sure. And, you know, I'm sure my screen. Hey, can you see me? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, At the 25 minute mark, stop what you're doing. And Hey, let's get out our counters. You know, this is great. Get us on a cliffhanger. You've done a little bit of value. They want to learn more. And, uh, you know, Hey, just, I trust by the way, who else is typically involved, uh, you know, in a buying decision like this? Like the last time you guys brought in a new software, oh, you needed the, you know, director of engineering and the, the CFO. Okay, well, uh, you know, in your calendar system, can you see are they available like next Tuesday at three or four? Uh, I'd love to just get something on the books. You know, if we need to move it around, that's fine. But let's just go ahead and get that schedule while we're we're here in the meeting. Yeah, that is in and of itself increases that velocity because then you don't have seven emails back and forth and they don't really yeah. pay attention. And then you're like, no. Oh, should I text them? But like, I don't know. Are we, are we close enough that we text? You should always text by the way, pro tip. Like I love getting a little text thread going. And I just say, Hey, it's my sunglass emoji. Uh, I had a sunglass company. So that's my, my go-to smiley guy. Uh, and that way, if you follow up two weeks later, like, Oh yeah, it's that guy. Okay. Uh, I know, I know what he's talking about. Yeah. But yeah. The, so I, can, I can imagine that you would do something like that, Kevin, with the, an emoji. What would your emoji be? Oh, probably a smiley face. A smi- yeah, well, you do no, have a smiley face. Probably pretty boring. I can't find one with black and white shirt on. I, I love the idea. I, every every now and again, if you want to be mysterious, I'll put uh, you know, the the one that you've just mentioned, Mike. That the yeah. you know with the sm- with the uh, sunglasses. You know, there's hmm. the uh, that that's a really smart thing. But you you were selling sunglasses. At some I was. Stage. Yeah. What what what, yeah. what made you do that? Ah, uh, well, um, and well, I'm gonna just. Let's get that in the show notes. There's a website called emojipedia.com where you can search anything and they have an emoji for it and you click a button, you copy it. So uh, just put that in your guys' pocket for later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so I got involved uh, in the sunglass game back in 2011. Um, uh, a friend of mine started this company, had a social mission similar to Tom Shoes or Warby Parker. Uh, the buy one, give one model. Uh, we eventually funded a, a number of site restoring cataract surgeries in developing worlds. Um but yeah, I, uh, I was a lifeguard growing up, so I love sunglasses, and I had some free time uh, somewhere in between grad school, and um, had no idea, by the way, that I would basically responded to a get involved at waveborn.com. I was like, hey, this the company looks great. Like, I'd love to help. Uh, you know, I got some time on my hands. Uh, that email changed my whole life. Like, I won't be talking to you guys today. That was my my accidentally diving headfirst into entrepreneurship. I did it for a year and nights and weekends while I still had my Deloitte job, and I finished grad school. and. Um, and I kind of stopped working on those two to work more on the sunglasses. And then, yeah, I spent, uh, the next five years traveling to sunny places, um, trying to change how people see the world, um, learned a lot about business and math. Uh, well, the funny thing is I was a math major. And so like, I, I got perfect score on every math standardized test. Like I was good with the numbers. I never took finance or accounting. I didn't understand what cash conversion cycles were. I didn't know what net 30 meant until I like literally delivered a case of sunglasses to a surf shop at the beach and he's like you know, where's the money and they're like oh yeah we'll pay you net 30 and i was like okay cool and like went in my car and I had to google like what does net 30 mean and i was like oh like they're not gonna pay me for a month you know uh and, and like that was me learning like I, I, I drove around beach towns with a you know car full of sunglasses um 
ultimately though, guys, I learned that there's four profits, there's non-profits, and then there's no profits. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I went bankrupt at, at 30. Uh, it did, uh, did not work out. I, and one lesson for the audience too, if you do raise money from investors, don't structure the convertible note to mature on your 30th birthday. Uh, because I did not have a party on a private island with a yacht. Uh, that was the day we officially defaulted on on all of our. So, some humbling wow. lessons. And well, I mean, you've had such an interesting and diverse career so far, and, and uh, genuinely diverse, but one that you can learn from all the time. And the nice Absolutely. thing is, you can bring in some of these lessons now into uh, Malloy Industries because you know, yeah. I mean, you make it what it is, don't you? So. Um, and I like the fact that you're brilliant with numbers. It, it's it's always great working with Kevin because he's way better than I'll ever be with numbers. And um, but he, he he also has a marketing brain as well, which is amazing for a, an accountant. Well, somebody who, who likes numbers. But um, but y you obviously get numbers, but you're also quite a good marketer. So what what's what what would you say is your primary skill? Uh, uh, well, great question. Um... I think it's pattern matching. Uh, you know, I have a kind of this pattern matching algorithm in my head, whereas I talk to entrepreneurs, uh, I can really understand one, I can empathize with their pain. Like I, I've been in those shoes. I understand what it's like to, uh, you know, balance all of the weight on the world on your shoulders. Uh, there are never enough hours in the day. Um, and there's usually something that is causing that migraine headache today. In this, you know, minute while I'm talking to them, let's talk about that. And then I either know a person smarter than me, uh, and, and I love the Henry Ford quote. He's like, I don't have to be the smartest guy in the room because I have this phone right here and I can pick it up and call anybody and they'll know the answer. You yeah. know, that's my approach at this stage, uh, yeah. especially because I, I have a, a two-year-old uh, chief cuteness officer uh, who works with us. Um, he is out with my wife right now because I said I had to have a formal conversation, but normally he is with me. And um, and so at this stage of life, like I want to be a dad. I want to be present and nurturing and, and supporting Max until he, he makes it to uh, to preschool. Mm. And with that, like I'm all about the connection. So like who can you talk to that's smarter than me that has more time in the day and two hands on a keyboard and, uh, you know, can solve it. And we also have a ton of resources uh, and kind of do it yourself solutions because not everybody needs a, to bring on a fractional executive. Not everybody has the time and the budget. And, um, you know, I'll probably share a. Uh, I'll find a couple of resources I can give to you guys to put in the show notes to help with folks. I got like a finance cheat sheet, uh, which is like a one page PDF full of all the formulas and things. And if I had that a decade ago, I probably would have, would have done a little bit better. Just send it to me. I'll sell it to Kevin. Um, there you go. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> Make sure you're on a good margin. He yeah, just yeah. wants that. You know, yeah, I mean, I love it. Desperately need that, Greg. Desperately. No. No, yeah, well, I can imagine that. But I mean, your, your, the way your brain works, I mean, it's just amazing. The, you remind me a lot of, of uh, we were talking earlier about, we had a, um, I met, I, I went to Orlando a couple of years ago and, and I met a, a dentist there at this conference. Very, very similar to you in, in many ways. Really bright guy. Brilliant dentist. Focused. Wait, wait Graham, Graham, real quick. Do you know what time you're supposed to go to the dentist? Um, <laughs> no, I don't know what time I, I'm supposed to go Two's to the dentist. Two o'clock? Uh, 2.30. Two thirty. Ah, 2.30. Uh, another dad job yeah um yeah, yeah. <laughs> kevin thinks that's so funny but um <laughs> little things there you, for, you uh, forgot what you can talk about now so you were saying there's a brilliant dentist who reminded you of well yeah well really you, I mean, you're very very similar i mean the guy uh, from um uh, uh phoenix or around the area and uh, and he um he had a, an amazing um intellect but also he'd, he'd really dissected this marketing issue of being a dentist for a particular market. You don't market to everybody. You have a particular area you focused on and you've got a particular solution. And you and you're you're obviously sort of looking at each individual bit of it with like you said, this you you get the pattern of the way in which people behave, think, oh, yeah. express their problems, and you come up with this solution to those problems. Um He's doing the same thing, but just in a completely different market. You're very similar. And I think you in touch. I would love to talk to him. Um, and uh, I would also say that for everybody listening, like the more time you spend understanding your ideal client profile and yeah. who it is that you're selling to, you can't be all things. You know, when I started this company three years ago, we tried to be all fractional executives for all sizes and types of businesses in every possible function. And like nobody knew who to refer me to. 
now like we have niche down like we help b2b SaaS ceos doing at least a million or two in revenue on their way to 10 to 20 million um that need help with sales uh and if in the conversation i pull out like oh yeah we could also use an executive coach or hey we need you know somebody to build the technology like i know people who can do those things because i've I've built out this roster of people Uh, but like our focus is there and if your offer is so specific that people are going to say no that's a good thing because then you're not wasting time talking to people that are not your ideal client who like you know if, if someone's like hey i need you uh you know to build me uh, this complicated thing that has nothing to do with sales and we're like no that's that's not what we do you know like uh, i used to maybe do some air table consulting projects and i have a couple clients that you know we d- did some stuff there but like we're not looking for new clients doing that uh, you know yeah. Um, and it makes it much easier to sell when it's a repeatable process. Yeah. And especially as your sales team grows, if you're trying to do all things for all people and everything's customized, like I'll, oh yeah, I'll, share, I'll be vulnerable. I'll share a lesson learned. Like about a year and a half ago, we tried to do a, um, what was it? A board of advisors subscription package. Uh-huh. And I was like, you know, pay us, you know, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 a month. And you can tap into this roster. You can have calls. They'll help you with stuff. We tried it for like six months. It was so complicated. I broke down all of the steps at one point. It was 36 different steps that went into selling it. And it was custom every time. And we threw the whole thing away. Mm. I think this is absolutely terrible. Nobody else can sell this. Nobody else can fulfill it to do the customer success and operations. Like we're at a point now, like I had a team of three, uh, including my chief QNIS officer and my operations manager. We just double. We've got a team of six now. uh, And we're building the systems and processes so that they can do so much that I was doing manually a year or two ago um, that don't require my unique abilities, my zone of genius, this, my strength zone, like for those listening, think about like, what can only you do? Like, what is the 20% that requires the way your brain thinks requires the things that you are incredibly talented and that are fascinating and motivating to you? Like, Hmm. you know, you could be really good at something, but you hate doing the Excel sheets and the reports, like hire a bookkeeper or whatever, like get somebody else to do it. Like I have a bookkeeper, I have an accountant, a tax person, like I don't have to do that. I talk to them for like 15 minutes a month to like just categorize some stuff because they don't know what I did on Venmo. Okay, cool. You know, Um, and it's important because as you delegate, uh, you're able to buy back your time. And one of the biggest struggles I see with entrepreneurs is they don't know how to confidently delegate because they don't have confidence in their people. Mm. And if we can bring in these uh, relentlessly generous experts who have decades of experience that they can be confident in, holy shit, like that, what it can unlock for them professionally and for their business, but also personally, because suddenly you don't have to be working 12 hours every day, seven days a week to earn enough hours in the week to do all of the things you can like put your phone over there and just like if you had 249 beauty queens and you sent the beauty queen into a into a business every now and again she's going to end up marrying the ceo i mean do you find that's a problem with your sales guys i I think the biggest problem is that i haven't been referring to them as beauty queens i think we should scrap this fractional executive thing and just call them beauty queens because that that analogy is landing uh right here in the heart for me yeah uh we do. Um, we have had one instance uh, where they did fall in love and uh, get married. And let me see if I can ride this analogy. Uh, we did get a fattened calf uh, as a dowry, uh, just right. to say we charge a placement fee, like a, a regular headhunter. And we have kind of a clause there saying you can't hire our folks full time. And if you do, uh, you know, we kindly ask for 25% of the first year salary. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and then, yeah. Uh, I am gonna do Kevin, I'm gonna ask you this. Uh do you know why why cows have hooves? Why do cows have hooves? And, and not feet. Do you know why? Feet. No, I don't know why. It's because they lack toes. <laughs> lack toes. <laughs> yeah, I, I he's good at throwing you from your train of thought completely. Yeah, I, yeah absolutely completely. Yeah. Remember, when this came with the yeah. fat and calf and when i said fat and calf i knew i was going to go to my cow jokes and i have like seven more cow jokes but we'll we'll save that for the appendium we'll, we'll just do that at the end but you yeah. i mean the, the the thing is you you you've covered that eventuality but it doesn't really ha- it doesn't happen that often um, no and and what what does happen more often is that we hire the full-time replacement we help source yeah. interview vet train and then we hand the baton and be like, hey, you know, you guys were doing two million. You're now up to five million. Why don't you bring in a full time 
uh, you know, sales leader, we'll stick around as long as you want. Um, and that's the, the what's great is like we started at five, it goes to 10 to 20, it gets back down to 10. Now you're there for like two hours a week, just kind of more coaching the new folks um, and, and providing that continuity. But at some point, you know, we want them to, to kind of graduate and grow. And Mike, there's a big parallel there with a lot of the fractional CFOs that I know. Yeah. They didn't become fractional CFOs in the first place to work for one one business. So I've spoken to an awful lot of them where, oh, I was here because we were going through this particular stage in the, the company's development. We were going through a fundraise. They needed the CFO experience. I brought that along, helped them do it, got the next level. Now growing again. So what I'm now doing, because they, they're now getting to a position that they, they need somebody who can give them more time than I can, I'm helping them recruit the full-time person or yeah. the person that can take some of the things that I've been doing as the, the fractional off me so that yeah. I can remain with the same time commitment. Mm. So I think, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the fractionals benefit. Can I add on that real Isn't quick? It? Yeah. Yeah. So I think what you highlighted what was beautiful was that the fractional comes in for a period of time and then somebody has to come to take the things off of them so they can even shuffle up again. Like I have a fractional operations manager for, we started at 15 hours a week. It got up to 20. We just hired three new people to take things off of her so she can kind of get back to where she was and, and doing some higher level stuff as we've been growing together. Um, and on the the fractional CFO with the fundraising, a lot of the um, maybe early work we do with customers and clients is that we actually help them on the fundraising. And so I started about a year and a half ago, a Malloy's monthly deal flow newsletter. It goes out to over 500 investors and super connectors. Uh, and we feature five pitch decks uh, of companies that are fundraising. And we know uh, that you know, all things being equal, people do business with people they like. Uh, and we want folks to know us, like us, and trust us. And if we can help introduce you to people who are going to write you a 25000 250000 few million dollar check, you're probably going to like us. And once you have the money in the bank, you need to grow and you need to do it quickly. And you know we can typically staff you up within uh, a few weeks. Um, so that's something that we do. And you know, we charge a couple hundred bucks just to pay for putting the whole newsletter together. Um, but for folks listening, uh, I want to introduce this concept of like, what's the value ladder of services that you provide? So it's not just, hey, you have to pay us $10,000 a month for a fractional executive. Like we can start at 5,000. We could also start at like a few hundred dollars if you just need help raising money. Um, and mm -hmm. we do it on a monthly basis. We get a bunch of applications. We pick the best five. We send them out. Um, and so if folks are looking to fundraise, our network is primarily in the US and Canada uh, in terms of investors. Um, mm -hmm. But that's something that we found over time is a great way to add value. And even before that, we have a bunch of stuff we just give away for free. You know, like I talk to entrepreneurs. I host like an entrepreneur roundtable every Wednesday at four o'clock East Coast. Um, and anybody can join and it's free and you bring whatever problems you have. And I'm just going to rapid fire. It's off. I get in flow and I'm just like, well, oh, you need this. Yeah, let's do this. And there's somebody on my team there and they send the resources and we get the follow ups. Um, and then we just publish it and, and I'll drop a link, I guess. Um, cause each week we share like, Hey, here are the resources we shared that are just free. You know, like we want to be relentlessly generous. We want to help and help and help. And at some point the karma, the math works itself out. Now B2B SaaS is a global market. Yeah. Are you just operating in the U S we are primarily operating. Oh, oh, here's great. Uh, we talked earlier about niching, niching down for your ideal client profile. We're focused on East coast to West coast time zones. Um, I love you guys. I'm enjoying this conversation, but I do not typically meet with anybody before 11 a.m. Uh, East Coast. Uh, I have a, a two-year-old. I spend the morning with my son. We typically go to the library at 10:30 for story time. You know, uh, and so the time zones uh, in Europe are hard for us. So we're we're really focused on that. Um, and I would say 95% of our fractional executives are kind of in that east to west coast time zone. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's quite hard the other way around as well, especially when you're attending seminars and people. Oh, he's going to start at. 12 mountain time, whatever that is. And, and, and then, then you look what the conversion is and it's like eight o'clock at night and you think, what the hell? Well, but, um, I, I can anyway. see here a, a, a huge opportunity for a, a SaaS company who are based in UK or Europe wanting to get into the huge market in the United States. And you're, you're effectively very well placed. Mm. We are. And that sales force 
across the Atlantic. Mm. Absolutely. And we, we have had uh, a couple of, we're bringing the business to the U.S. And, um, mm. and it's worked very well, uh, especially because not only do these folks have decades of experience, they have Rolodexes. Some of them are old enough that they literally still have the like note card Rolodex thing. Uh, you know, uh, that they can call up people they've been doing business with for 20 or 30 years. It speeds up that velocity of the sales funnel uh, to you, you get the qualified meeting right away. Okay, what do we need to do? Let's make sure the demo looks good. You know, how are we presenting it? What's the the value prop? What are the pain points specific to this client? Um, yeah, so that's, that's definitely uh, things that it, we can help it's with. A, the, when you're outside of the US, the US market is a hard one to break into. And Americans yeah. like talking to Americans. Americans look at websites and want to want to see a U.S. business address. Yeah, well, and in this day and age of B two B sales, more than fifty seven percent of the buying decision is made before they even contact a human. And mm -hmm. so, what your website says, how you present it, um, and uh, are you guys familiar with the Pastor framework, uh, where it's problem accentuate yeah. the problem solution yeah. transformation offer response like you got to start with the problem uh and i learned this i think uh i think it was a guy matt learner i think he's in the uk uh follow on linkedin he said like your headline on your website should answer now you can like and then fill in the blank and then like that's what the thing is like solve whatever that problem is and make sure um you know that in your messaging and in your dialogue with future customers you're asking questions that shine spotlights, like shine the spotlight up right on the problem, the pain point that they that your um, product or service solves. Because if they're not thinking about the pain, they don't care about solving it. Like, yeah. let's say uh, you're taking a shower, you don't have a bath. And like every time you get out, you like almost slip and fall and you're going to break your neck. That's when you want it solved. But right then you're soaking wet and you're naked and you probably don't have your phone with you. And so you don't go on Amazon and buy a new bath. Mat. Like. Three hours later, you're not thinking, oh, yeah, I should really get a bath mat. Like, no, the problem. So you have to find your future customers when they're feeling the pain. If they're not feeling the pain, then dig the knife in a little bit. Like, let's accentuate it. Let's talk about, like, how much it sucks that you're never home for dinner with your wife and you're missing your kids uh, games on the weekend because you're working, uh, you know, and that you don't uh, trust the people that you're working with and you don't have enough confidence in yourself. And you have this imposter syndrome, which is delicate. You do need to, you know, th be thoughtful there. I'm not but the idea is like so many entrepreneurs are full of self-doubt. They're not sure that they're making the right decisions. They've never done this before. They've never had a seven figure on its way to eight figure business. Yeah. And if we can bring in people who can make you feel more confident in yourself, in your ability to lead the business, and that the stuff you're not really good at is handled by a professional. Oh my God, you can breathe so much better. And, and that's that transformation where, you know, Hey, it's 501. I'm, I'm heading home. My wife and I, we got date night tonight. Uh, we got a babysitter, uh, you know, let's go. I went on a date with my wife last night, a double date for the first time since our son was born. We went on a double date uh, because we had a mixer. It was great. And I didn't have to worry about work. Uh, and I would love to help other people have a meal of food with someone you enjoy. Uh, you know, Kevin Graham, I don't know if you guys like eating together or not. I can't quite tell. Uh, I feel like that that meal of food might be uh, a little, little fun banter going back and forth. It would be if we ever got together that often, wouldn't it, Graham? We we we, off, we rarely get together, and we have we have met a few times, and we some like mm. six or seven times in the okay. nine years or something that we've been doing this, it was eight years or whatever it is. So you know, we, we do like to keep our professional distance. You know, that's important. You know, um, but we have met in quite an extraordinary occasion. I mean, Kevin, we, we there's a there's a great half marathon that ha happens in Newcastle, and it ends up on uh, South Shields and. Kevin met me there at the end because I, I can't remember whether it was your son and my daughter were running. That's and, correct. And the, yes. thing, the thing is, Kevin had just come back from America and he came back equipped with a red, which is a bit of a problem for me, but a red make America great again. And and of course, um, uh, you know, I was wearing it and, and I, I was going to get, because at the time, I think he was still president, wasn't he? And, and the point, I think the, the point of it was that, you know, um, people for some reason didn't didn't much care for him, but you know now they've got every reason in the world to love him because they've got an, they've got the Antichrist in charge. So basically, it's you know what what kind of Graham, I'm just gonna I'm gonna interrupt real quick and it's called a context switch. I'm gonna ask, do you know what the sushi said to the bumblebee? No. 
Wasabi. <laughs> All right. Okay. Fair enough. I get. Thank you for for taking us out of that um, little loop. Um, but um, uh, it, you know, but the beauty the beauty of the uh, we don't really meet that often. But um, it's it's nice that we've we've known each other for a yeah. long time. But, but you know, thinking thinking about the the folks that work former law industries as fractionals, you know, are you finding that the, this fractional thing appeals to people that still want to work full time but want variety? Or are you finding it's much more that people want to want to not work part time and might say, well, if I do two or three roles on two or three days a week, well, that is now great for me. Yeah, I, I think people are realizing that and whether whether they got laid off because of what tech firing, whatever it is, you know, or um, there's a variety of reasons that people are interested in fractional. I'll say this. Uh, what I have really is a marketplace of supply of fractional executives, demand of entrepreneurs who need them. The supply is bountiful. I have a meeting later today. I call it an exploring collaborations meeting. We do it once a month with 15 people who want to join our roster that we're going to vet. We're going to talk through and explain how it goes. Um, there are so many people who want this because they see it as a much better way to live and for them to work and to also more lucratively make money than just a, a salary doing one job for one company because they have the, the brains. You know, if uh, I don't know if you guys know, Cal Newport is an author, uh, wrote a book, wrote many books. Uh, I just read Slow Productivity, would recommend Deep Work. He wrote, uh, but back in the day, he wrote um, uh, Be So Good They Can't Ignore You. Uh, one of the things he talks about is acquiring this career capital where you can turn down a promotion and like quit your job to then go do this thing on the side, mm. you know, one or two days a week with two or three clients, uh, you can make more money and work way less mm. because you don't have to deal with all the bureaucracy and the paperwork and the 17 meetings with, you know, whoever you just, you have a couple of meetings and then you get your stuff done, you, you know, uh, and move things forward. And um, I think it is an amazing opportunity for people to, um, have more autonomy in their life and also set the hours when they want to work. Like it's not a nine to five, like you get your stuff done when you get your stuff done, you know? And if for me, that's like, I like to wake up at five or six in the morning and get a few hours in before the house wakes up. And then I have some family time and then sun naps from two to five and I do all my sales meetings in two to five. Uh, and that's it. And, and I, and I tell people, I was like, no, I can't meet then, you know? Um, and like, I set my wife a calendar invite for this slot. Cause I was like, Hey, you need to have max because I'm, uh, you know, in, in this meeting, um, when he was little, he could like be in sales meetings. He was a good wingman. Like now he's much more mobile and has a lot of thoughts and opinions and is, is amazing. Like I'm, I love this kind of dad. Does he understand life. the dad jokes yet though? Oh, he loves it. He loves it guys. And I have to share that this relationship is based on trust. We have a page a day dad joke calendar next to his high chair. And so every morning we rip one off and we read the joke and he he has learned that he just laughs as I get to the punchline. He doesn't necessarily uh, know. I mean, how long does it go I have? Oh, that's nice. Um, it, it's been um, a revelation, uh, Mike. Uh, you've been an, an absolutely fab fabulous guest today on the next 100 Days podcast. Thank you. So, Graham. Fractional is certainly the root of the future. I know I deal with a lot of fractional CFOs, regularly speak to them. In our business, we've got a fractional CMO helping us marketing. And that's very powerful because she brings a big team of fractional people with her. Mm. But fractional sales, I hadn't given a thought to. Mm. I, I think one of the things that, I mean, it's, it's so logical, isn't it? Because basically, <laughs> you know, um it, people are disrupting every kind of market and this sort of well this market yeah. of sales it's everywhere but the cleverness of 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 uh of of how mike's created his business is that he's i think he started by being all things to everybody and he and he soon found out that's a really rubbish strategy and and so he, he he's now very highly niched and so he basically he looks after one particular market and and that means that he can repeat the kind of solutions and he can systematize for those clients and for the people that work with him. So I just think it's so smart to be focused on. And then, of course, you've got 
a particular set of problems that you're regularly solving and getting results for clients with. So, you know, I, it's so smart. And um, I, I called him earlier a renaissance man, and he really is. He's, he's, he's done so many different things, and, and yet he still isn't out of his 30s. Yeah, and now if you if you're running a business that's that's managed to get get to seven figures, you know, you're not going to be able to afford that experienced salesman, no salesperson, I should say, mm. that that can that's going to cost you two hundred and fifty thousand a year, and is going to take you to the next level. But you can probably afford some of the fractional rates that are there. It makes a lot yeah. of sense. It's the it's the same economic common sense that takes you to a fractional CFO. Mm. I, I, there's the the, the it's a, it's a, there's no fat in this, is there? I mean, these guys hit the ground running, um, and they they'll come into your organisation and get the job done, um, and they're capable. They're not like they're not wet behind the ears. I mean, they, they didn't come down with yesterday's rain. The whole idea of this is that you're getting somebody with connections, also with skill, and they're the fractional resource you're going to get that you wouldn't otherwise, as you say, Kevin, you wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. So another really good podcast um, with Mike Malloy, and we'll put everything. It, actually, Mike shared with us a number of things that we're going to share with you. Um, and so hit the show notes on this particular recording because there's a whole bunch of value that you're going to get just by going to the show notes. Absolutely. I think I'm looking forward to seeing one or two of those things that, that Mike added myself. Yeah, me too. Um, so um, I've been Graham Arrowsmith. I've been Kevin Appleby. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>